So I will now give the word again to Gianluca, who will introduce the last speaker of the session. Thank you very much again, and uh, speak soon. Okay, thank you, Attilio. So the last speaker is Patrice Genevet from uh, CNRS and the uh, Université of Côte d'Azur in France. Patrice Genevet obtained his PhD at the University of Nice in France on localized spatial solitons in semiconductor lasers and amplifiers. After his PhD, he did five years of postdoc fellowship between 2009 and 2014 in the Capasso's group at Harvard University in collaboration with Professor Scarly from Texas a and M University. In 2014, he obtained his position of senior research scientist at A Star in Singapore. And in 2015, he joined CNRS as Chargé de Recherche de Première Classe. He is the recipient of the ERC Starting Grant 2015 on functional set optical components and applications, the ERC Proof of Concept 2019 and the MA Cotton Prize 2017 from the French Optical Society. Patrice Genevet's research activities concern the development of optical metasurfaces for sensing, imaging, and LiDAR applications. The title of today's presentation is Physics, Applications, and Integration of Metasurfaces. So thank you again, Dr. Patrice Genevet, for, for me here today, and please, the stage is yours. Fantastic, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Very good. Yes, thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for attending uh, this uh, presentation and this uh, uh, seminar Sorry here. Um, I'm lucky here because uh, uh, Professor Martin did a lot of introduction related to the topics of Metasurface and uh, and I would like to thank him for that, obviously. Uh, uh, my job here would be to focus more on the possibilities to use those uh, devices for application. And I will discuss also, but very briefly, about uh, the physics uh, of, of Metasurface. So I'm going to start by obviously thanking all of the people that have contributed to the work, uh, the postdoctoral fellows and also the PhD student currently in my group, and the different sources of fundings and the uh, industries with whom we are developing those uh, those uh, device and we are applying the metasurface uh, into into system and, and device so um just to briefly summarize the the talk here i divided in three sections one which is i call generalities which has been briefly mentioned uh, also by uh, professor martin then i will go to the crux of this talk which are uh, the application and then i will conclude in the application, I will talk in particular, for example, of uh, uh, devices for uh, LIDARs and, and also for wavefront shaping. Okay, so before, before, to, before to start uh, in the discussion of those nanostructures and, and their response on, and so on and so forth, I think I need to maybe start with something very basic that uh, I guess every single of you knows very well. Uh, is the way of how light reflect and refract from an interface, right? So you know that uh, if you have an interface uh, that separates two medium that are transparent, uh, light is generally reflected at the same angle, but it's refracted at an angle here, which depends only on the refractive index of the material. And this is what people call the Snell law, uh, and that has been used uh, for many years to create uh, various optical components, lenses, uh, and so on and so forth you have these beautiful effects that can be explained uh, by the simple Snell loop. There is a very nice way to um, explain that, uh, uh, this behavior, and it's given uh, in, the, in the book of Feynman's by uh, as considering the following situation where you have here a droning person. In his book, he said, um, you know, Feynman probably, you know, call this the sum of his uh, background, but he said that it's a beautiful blonde girl, which is uh, droning here. Uh, and you have the lifeguard here trying to, to save her. Uh, and uh, the way to save her uh, is to minimize, minimize the time she's spending in the water, right? So you need to minimize the time between your position and the drowning person. And because you run generally faster than what you swim, you better spend more time on the ground before starting to, uh, to, to swim. So if you apply this minimization problem, to the problem of light refraction, you obtain uh, exactly the same, replacing the running swim and swimming speed, sorry, by the uh, 
actual uh, phase velocity of light, which is related to the refractive index, uh, you end up by getting uh, the Snell law. It's a minimization problem. So now suppose that uh, so you are here, uh, you are you are you are sitting, for example, here, and you hear someone is drowning uh, here in the sea. Obviously, uh, you could think about going this way, right? So either you know how to fly, uh, or or you might have some trouble uh, going down. You might not be able to reach. If you want to start down, cli down climbing, the 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 um, this uh, this cliff here is going to take a lot of time, right? So you see, the cliff is actually changing in height, it's changing in height to the point where here it becomes accessible, and it will take probably much less time to down climb this part and, and going to this uh, to, and, and reaching this person. So you see, those two different paths now uh, have to take into account not only the running and swimming speed, but also the time it takes to. Uh, pass, let's say, this abrupt, discontinuous type of interface here. So now if you take into account this uh, time here by considering the gradient of height here at the interface, you could uh, uh, obtain a law which account, I will go a little bit more in detail on that, but that account for the actual shape of your discontinuity along your interface. And you can generalize here this way, the reflection and refraction law where the refracted angle now is not only controlled by the refractive index, but also by the actual shape of your discontinuous uh, lines uh, of, intro, of, of your interface. So now uh, let's, let's try to come back to optics and try to uh, make some uh, meaningful uh, uh, features uh, on what we just said, right? So we, we know that if we generally refract light at an interface, we obtain normal Snell law that are fixed in angle. And we just say that if we introduce at the interface here, a layers of discontinuous optical phase response, which is equivalent to down climbing with a, 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 a variation of time, uh, which is partially varying of your interface, uh, you, can, you can eventually modify the refraction. So the way it works for, for, for optics is the following. Light comes, it interacts with an assembly of nanostructures, and each of them have different size, different material properties, as it was mentioned before, such that their scattering or their transmission phase varies from uh, elements to elements. And then now if you take the, the envelope of those refracted waves, right, so these are secondary waves if, that we can consider as a Jugend source, uh, they are going to be refracted at an angle essentially that is controlled by the actual phase gradient. So we did this uh, demonstration back in 2011 when I was a postdoc in Federico's group, where we use here um, these metallic V-shaped structures that are designed such that the light interacting with the structure in transmission, for example, uh, varies from structure to structure such that in the far field, you see between the first and the last element, you have a, a, a phase variation which is equivalent to a wavelength. So you have a two pi phase variation introduced by gradual changing the geometry from the left to the right. So you create this way a, a, a slope of varying height for photonic structure. And that leads to this uh, generalized Snell law where you have arbitrary control, not arbitrary, you have control on the refracted angle simply by controlling the shape and the arrangement of those nanostructures. And you can produce, for example, this kind of funny behavior where light appears to be refracted uh, in an opposite direction. So the way you do that, the way you create these nanostructures is uh, using following, uh, the following elements, for example, here. We'll come back a little bit more in detail in the physics, but uh, you see, you need to have quite packed uh, and quite dense interface of elements which are generally sub-wavelengths in size and sub-wavelengths in period so that you avoid any diffraction uh, response from your interface. So that your interface, if you want here, behave as a, an homogenized interface with a spatially varying uh, phase response in this case. So why is it interesting? Why do, do we bother doing this kind of structure? The reason is that uh, we've been, as I mentioned, uh, we've been doing optics using refraction of light in the material and to, to, for example, focus light to make lenses and components. Generally, we need to work with bulky device. Uh, you shape the material in a, in a way that light comes from planar to be a focus here. So the point here is that with uh, these devices that are typically centimeter scale, uh, using the approach that I just mentioned based on metasurface, we can create interface, photonic interface that can focus exactly the same way 
as a optical components, but they are hundreds of nanometers thin. In terms of reduction of weight and, and, and so on and so forth, it's quite interesting. But probably the most interesting uh, 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 in terms of application is that this approach enables what we call uh, wafer level fabrication for optical components. So instead of having to grind a piece of uh, bulky material like here, one can think about making essentially optics using the same approach as what we are doing in the foundries for making uh, electronics. And so you can think about making optics on a chip with optical components that are flat, they call that also flat optics, like an engineer, phase amplitude and the polarization of light with a single interface. And you could think about making, for example, this kind of lens device on a big chip uh, using um, um, CMOS, uh, CMOS uh, foundries, for example. And uh, you can get uh, structures that are very, very complex. And, and the point here is to understand, you know, and that's what I would like to give as a, a little bit of an, an introduction, uh, understanding the uh, response of those nanostructures and how you assemble to get your optical response, your, your, your optical functionality. So yeah, so I would like to start here by, uh, as I mentioned, um, a little bit of introduction on the generalities, discussing the uh, uh, mechanisms that we are using for nano nanoscale phase control. In fact, there are three of them. The first one we call resonant scattering. It has been very well explained uh, by uh, uh, Professor Martin about this resonant scattering. The second one is geometric phase. And the third one is uh, an effective index waveguide phase accumulation. So resonant phase, uh, again, it has been discussed, uh, you, it, it has been very well explained also that for plasmonic resonators, uh, interaction of light with uh, electron, uh, free electrons on the metals uh, enables resonance that can maximize, maximally address pi phase delay. Uh, in order to reach 2 pi, uh, you need to combine, and again, it has been mentioned, you need to combine both an electric and a magnetic response and it's generally done in a dielectric resonators where you have the possibilities of exciting more complex modal response. By superposing those two electric and magnetic resonances, people have been uh, shown that you could get two pi. So the physics here is not very clear, but uh, nevertheless, using two resonances, uh, it, is, it has been shown that you can address two pi phase, which is what you need, obviously, to create a full wavefront control. You need a two pi phase variation and the control of this two pi phase variation to design wavefront. So the second approach, uh, which uh, uh, is used for making a meta surface, and these are the typical elements that I showed here, uh, it's called geometric phase addressing. Uh, it relies on a mechanism which is uh, uh, essentially related to polarization conversion. So you, you, the way it works is the following. Uh, if you have a half wave plate uh, and you send on a half wave plate a left circularly polarized light, uh, if the half wave plate is very well designed, then you get at the output a uh, right circularly polarized, right? Because halfway plate introduce pi, pi phase delay uh, in one of the uh, uh, um, axis, you know, in the polarization uh, uh, axis of this birefringent crystals. So now obviously you can always rotate this halfway plate and what is going to happen is the phase in the uh, 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 transmitted polarization converted uh, has to, uh, is, is going to vary by twice the rotation angle of your actual uh, eigen polarization. This is uh, one of the, um, I would say, a particularity, if you want, of, uh, of a polarization conversion in a wave plane. So then uh, the point is, if, if now you have understood this, uh, then the, the idea is to make essentially tiny device that behave as a half wave plane. And these are the design of geometric phase structure. They are um, anisotropic structures, as you see here, that are designed to introduce a different phase retardation between X and Y eigen polarization modes of this structure, such that the light transmitting coming from left circular polarization are going to be converted because one of the polarization, the Y axis is getting pi phase delay. So you reverse, you see the EY is now reversed to the opposite direction and you end up getting a right circular polarization. So if you have a pi phase shift between the two eigen polarization modes, you have a halfway plate. Now, the only thing that you need to do is to assemble those elements at your interface with a, a, a rotation such that you spatially vary the phase response of your uh, component. So if you want to make a lens, you just spatially vary the orientation so as to follow phase response of a lens uh, uh, and so on and so forth. 
The third approach, which is called the Effective Index Web Guide, um, it's, uh, I would say, a bit more classical. The idea is to create uh, nano pillars, so structures here with a certain diameters uh, that uh, essentially uh, uh, transmit light with a, a, a phase retardation that is function of both the height and the diameters. Just to understand this uh, uh, figures here, this picture in a bit more detail, I've made the following uh, uh, schematic here. So suppose that light comes from a substrate, transmit uh, through air here, for example, a certain height of air, you know that the uh, phase delay is essentially K0 time uh, the actual thickness here. So you have a, a certain phase. Now, if you replace this uh, uh, material here, sorry, with a, a, a refractive index, let's say high refractive index, then the phase uh, uh, transmission is K0 N time uh, H, right? So it's, uh, you have a higher phase retardation. So then the idea is just nanostructuring this material. If you nanostructure the material, if you, your radius is zero, and if your radius is essentially equal to the period, you go from the mean to the max phase value. And so you have uh, possibilities by uh, controlling the diameters to engineer, as it is shown here, by changing the diameters of the structure, you engineer the phase transmission from zero to two pi. If the height here is such that the phase difference between phi max and phi mi minus is uh, above, above two pi. Right? So you can easily calculate that. You just uh, need as a rule of thumb in terms of design, uh, thickness here of your material which is essentially lambda divided by delta n, so as to avoid to have at least uh, two pi phase retardation by changing diameters. So once you have these three uh, uh, mechanisms, the uh, resonant phase, you have the uh, geometric phase, or those effective in this web guide, you can start making uh, you, you can start making uh, optical components. And this is where I want to go now: is to essentially, I would say, uh, highlight the results that we obtain in my group, uh, where we go from uh, understanding physical concept and all the way to, I would say, concrete and direct application of those components. So just as a summary of the recent result and the work we are doing, we are working from physical concept on the development of what we call topological metasurfaces. We have uh, an ensemble of equipment and uh, uh, measurement system and optical benches to characterize and to do the metrology of those metasurfaces. You have an example here where we are uh, making a metasurface which has two different phase values. And we are measuring here directly the phase, transmission phase at the metasurface where we engineer spatially varying phase from zero to 90 degrees. And you have the possibilities of encoding spatial phase distribution. We are also working on holography and you have an example here of a metasurface which we design uh, that is uh, projecting uh, letters of uh, intensity in the far field. And during the design here, we uh, take careful attention to control the polarization of each of these letters independently so that each letters can be projected with a given state of polarization. We also work on uh, techniques on techniques to correct optical aberration. Here is an example of an imaging system that shows the device a normal lens here, if you want, uh, the imaging with a normal lens. And here on the right, the uh, aberration corrected system using a metasurf to compensate for, for the aberration. We are also interested in integrating those uh, meta surfaces in systems. And uh, here is an example, I will talk about that, of how we can integrate the meta surface into Vixel for wavefront engineering, and also uh, work that we are doing in my group on LiDAR and imaging devices using meta surfaces. So obviously I won't have time to go in the detail in each of those uh, uh, different topics. I just select three of those, uh, and I will start from the laser wavefront engineering. So what we did, as I mentioned, so we, we use this effective, uh, effective index uh, modes, you know, to control the transmission phase by changing the diameters or the radius of those pillars here, the phase variation ranges to pi. And then what we did, we uh, implement an optical components that relies on arrangement of those nanostructure building blocks here, directly on the bottom face emitting of a, a VIXEL. A VIXEL is a laser that are emitting, that is a generally oscillating here in the um, lambda over two cavity here, be comprised between two DBR mirrors. And the light emitted from this aperture that are typically like one to two microns, generally, because it's a very small aperture, you have a huge divergence. 
the idea was to uh, collect the beam uh, that is emitted from this small aperture and try to use a metasurface to collimate, for example, right? So if you want to collimate, you just need to make essentially here a lens with a focal distance that corresponds to the propagation here. And you can calculate uh, essentially the phase profile of the collimators according to the lens, essentially desired lens uh, phase profile. Once you have that, you start making a discontinuous phase profile. You discretize into the number of phase elements that you have, essentially the different radiuses that you want to use. And you start uh, assembling your metasurface by putting this discrete array of nanopillars. So here is the result. So what we did, we did a very simple measurement where we have your laser emitting and you have a, an imaging system here, which uh, make an image plane directly on a CCD. Uh, and what we did, we Z translate this uh, system so as to look at the propagation uh, properties and the focusing properties of your uh, pixel light. This is uh, uh, the image where you don't have, for example, here any metasurface. You see that light diffract very way, very fast because there is no collimation component. Sorry. And when you, you, you change now, you put here on the output uh, lenses with different focal distance, you can get focal focalization or you can get to the point where the beam is essentially collimated. And it's collimated when the focal distance is equal to the thickness of your substrate layer. What is interesting is that the beam profile is very good. And with this approach, you can reduce the divergence of classical pixel from 36 degrees down to about one degrees uh, while maintaining and this is very important because the metasurface is outside of your laser system uh, it maintains the performance you know like the industries have developed for more than 20 years uh, all of the uh, electronic packaging and stuff and, and so forth so they don't want you know to start messing around with the uh, packaging they made so what the, what we do here we just put the component outside and we keep essentially the laser performance the same it's just that we collimate the light with a, a component here is a, an image of the uh, a video that shows sorry here if it works no i need to uh, maybe stop this guy uh, option du pointer. Uh, I don't know how to stop this guy. Sorry. Yes, like this. Uh, that shows essentially the image from the uh, metasurface plane and I Z scan to observe essentially the collimation and the performance of this stuff. You see, without metasurface, you lose the beam because it's not collimated. And with the uh, device, it remains collimated as a spot uh, uh, as expected from the from the collimation properties of this lens. But then what you could do, you could design uh, multiple wavefront engineering here. Instead of having only one wavefront, you can start making multiplex beam. For example, three beams uh, organized here along the uh, uh, Y dimension, or you can design a beam a laser that will create three beam spot along the uh, X dimension, or you can create matrices of, matrix of dots. And this is in fact very important. Uh, the application of this uh, device, uh, it's uh, important because it's used in uh, essentially all um, uh, iPhone uh, and different type of uh, cell phone to do facial recognition. So they, they, they use a laser to uh, create a, a point cloud, which is used as a way to do uh, facial recognition. So this device uh, might have some uh, uh, important application, uh, for example, for this kind of, uh, of, of device. Of course, you can use it uh, for uh, inter interconnect uh, and so on and so forth. This was just to give you uh, a possible application. Okay, so this is for the uh, the, <clears throat> the Vixel device. We are also working a group on a technique to uh, uh, improve uh, LiDAR, LiDAR imaging. LiDAR uh, is an acronym for Light Detection and Ranging that uh, is a technique that is used to make three-dimensional images. So the way it works is uh, the following. You have a laser here that uh, is uh, scanning a certain scene that is observing a certain area and is mapping the position of object by sending pulses that reflect from the, 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 the scene and come back to a detector. By measuring the time it takes to make this round trip, uh, you basically can uh, recover the distance and scanning, you get a three-dimensional image using what is called the time of flight. So what we did uh, very recently is a system like this where we combine um, an acousto-optic deflector, which is a device that do very narrow 
uh, scanning with a, a meta surface here, which is a wide array of meta surface and design such that you have a spatially varying uh, response of your deflection angle. Let me say it differently. Depending on where the beam impact on the meta surface, the output angle changes. If you are on the very edge, you have very large deflection angle. If you pass by the center, you don't have any deflection. Essentially, we implement a spatially varying phase response so that we, uh, uh, depending on the beam point, we can explore a wide field of view. So this is the type of uh, system how it looks. The source comes directly to the AOD and this is scanning the meta surface and you, you end up by getting an extended, extended field of view of about 140 degrees. So we start with a one dimensional scan where we scan the meta surface only 1D and we put uh, three reflectors and we scan one dimensional and we measure the time of flight that the pulse does in every single position. And then we obtain this image here that shows a reflecting signal at different time, essentially different distance here. And uh, you can imagine that here, this is a, a 2D image where you have here the uh, uh, box reflectors, here the round reflectors that I showed you before, and then this small uh, piece of reflector here. So then what we did, we cascade only, not only one acousto-optic deflector, but two, so as to make a, a, a radial uh, like a, a exploration on the meta surface, so, so as to have two dimensional, two angle scanning. And we did with this way, three dimensional, LiDAR imaging here. So you, we have a scene, we equip some people with reflective clothes, and we did a two-dimensional scanning where we scan both angle, theta and phi, and we recover at every single point the actual time of flight, and we obtain here in color uh, the depth of those different people. These are the ranging distance. And you have here a video, I need to do the same trick as before, I apologize, yes, uh, where you see the intensity of the reflected signal, and on the right, the actual time of flight. Right, where you see people playing a ball here and uh, they can exchange ball. Uh, and you see on the right here, uh, uh, you have encoded in color the actual distance, which help us to extract from those video three-dimensional information. So what is interesting is that with our approach, uh, we, we, can, we can use MetaSurface to do multi-beam uh, design. For example, we can mimic human vision. Human vision is very peculiar. We have a a certain narrow field of view where we have high resolve uh, images. These are the central vision, but we also have a peripheral view, which is generally uh, 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 less uh, accurate where the number of sensors in the uh, back uh, focal plane, the back plane of the eyes is less dense. So you have a, a smaller resolution. So what we did, we were trying to mimic this behavior by using the same technique. You have an acousto-optic modulator that scan a meta surface but this time the meta surface is made such that part of the light is transmitting. So we only uh, left, let's say 50% of the light scan on the zero order with narrow field of view. And at every single point, we also generate a second beam that is exploring a much wider field of view. Of course, uh, the, the resolution that you have in the center, because we are scanning the same beam, uh, the resolution here is much higher than the resolution that we have on the edge. And with that, we are able to create uh, using the proper detection scheme that is looking only at the reflected signal from the surrounding, which means essentially we block what comes from the center, we see peripheral view and uh, another detectors, which is blocking everything on the edge, but the central uh, numerical aperture here, we are able to resolve, highly resolve with high resolution, the uh, second object here. So with, this, with only a single beam here, we can mimic uh, a wide field of view and a very highly resolved uh, central vision, essentially providing a, a solution for mimicking human vision for robotic application, for example. Why is it interesting? Uh, it's interesting because- uh, Sorry, yes. sorry, but it's sorry to interrupt you. Just to say you have a few minutes left. Yes, perfect. Thank you. I'm going to conclude with the, the, this, uh, this slide. I have a few stuff, but I'm going to, to skip it. Uh, here, essentially, uh, why is it so interesting? It's interesting because with this approach, you know, we can uh, we, we can scan the device at a very high frequency. And we were able to show, for example, 2D imaging here at a speed that reach uh, a kilo, uh, kilohertz imaging frame rate. So you have here an example of a, a reflecting device, which we mount on a, on a rotation wheel here. It's a chopper in the lab. And what we did, we measure, we did image, we did, uh, we acquire image, right? Up to uh, here, 
12 uh, milliseconds, for example, and we acquire, uh, so, so each of these images are, are, are acquired by scanning essentially every single point here and measuring the time of light. And when you see a spot here, it corresponds to the position of these reflectors. Because the wheel is rotating, you see uh, that in the image, you see the rotating uh, objects here. What is interesting is that with that, now you can make a cross-section and find the, poly the angular position, and you see that you can recover the actual rotation period. And what is interesting is that you see that you have here some sort of a wobbling here that is essentially responsible because we put a reflectors on the wheel, which make it asymmetric uh, in, in the weight distribution and it becomes... So, I mean, with this approach, we were able... The point here is, is that we were able to observe objects that are moving uh, at very, very high speed. We are rotating at 100 Hertz on an object which is located on the edge, essentially going at the speed here, which is essentially above the, uh, the the speed of sound, for example, right? So this is something which, uh, in terms of imaging, is a really impressive capabilities. And uh, in terms of dimension, uh, as you see here, is respecting, we are respecting what we are observing. Just one, uh, maybe one slide, I will do it very fast. Uh, these are the introduction I gave about the mechanisms that we have for metasurface, and I say resonant, the geometric, and effective index. In fact, the, uh, we are starting to understand that the way we've been using this resonant phase is in fact not very accurate. And we need to replace, uh, and uh, I, I recommend you to take a look of this uh, recently submitted archive paper here. Uh, in fact, the physics associated to phase retardation using the resonant problem is related to singular physics and the fact that you, you, you introduce phase according to specific topological response of your photonic component. I'm going to say one word because I know it's, it's, it's finishing. So uh, the, the reason why uh, it's related to topological physics is that uh, we are working with systems that are non-emission. By non-emission, I mean that we are not working in a system where light is a stack between a perfect perfect mirrors, right? Where generally you have, for example, the cavity here, uh, uh, energy conserve, eigen frequency that are real, and so you have a resonant modes that are called normal modes. If your light is interacting, it's non-emission, is interacting with the environment, as a metasurface does. You have some input light and some reflected or transmitted light. The frequency of your system are not anymore real. They are complex and decay in time. And uh, these uh, quasi-normal modes uh, are essentially what govern the physics of metasurface. And what we've been doing is to try to understand how the physics uh, associated to complex eigenfrequency essentially control the response of those uh, uh, meta nano resonators and how we can exploit that to go to uh, to pi phase delay. I'm going to skip this because I know I'm late. It's uh, a bit too bad, but uh, I just want to conclude and thank you for your attention. Um, I think this approach of Metasurface is very interesting because, of course, it enables making arbitrary type of optical components, lenses, whatever. But th there are, uh, thanks to this technique, a lot of emerging uh, areas for application. And for me, uh, this approach essentially offers unlimited perspective for, for industrial application. So I really think that, uh, that there is, there is a, lot, a lot to be doing with these devices. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And again, if I'm late, I apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrice, for your very interesting talk. The schedule is very tight, but we have time for a few questions. I see that there is a question from the panel from Marco Gandolfi, who write, writes that it seems that the phase increases very fast when the distance from the center of a lens is large. In such a regime, can you still have enough nanopillars to follow the change of a phase? Or in other words, what would you do if the phase change is too by of two pi occurs over a distance shorter than the distance between one pillar and the next one? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question and it's very true. Um, uh, if you are in the center here of those devices, uh, the phase variation is relatively small, you know. And as you go to the edge, uh, the phase variation increases rapidly. The spatial variation of the phase increases. Um, generally, if you want to have a relatively well resolved wavefront, you need to have at least, let's say, three to four, generally it's four, four phase elements per two pi period units. And of course, as you go to the edge where the phase gradient is very important, you might not be able to fit within this spatial variation, uh, the spatial distance, 
uh, more than two uh, devices. And in that case, what is happening, uh, you are going to reduce drastically the efficiency. So you start to modify, if you want, the performance of your lens because the effective numerical aperture, right? Because what define the refraction angles on the edge, uh, I mean, it's related to the numerical aperture. You're going to modify the effective numerical aperture of your components, and you are going to modify the focusing response, the imaging quality, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a very good point. And uh, uh, there are people that have been trying to find solution to improve the efficiencies of high uh, numerical aperture lenses by considering coupling between elements. This is a way to do it and, and, and it might work. It's just that you have to make it refined, more, more refined if you want designs. Okay, thank you. I thank think you. that there is a direct question from uh, Anna. Yes, uh, thanks, Patricia. I have a fast question uh, here um, about uh, the, um, the this cell. I was wondering uh, how much is um, is critical the alignment of the meta surface with the laser, the order of magnitude, because I have no idea. Yeah, this is a very good question. I might have some slides for that because you know, like we did this measurement, in fact. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can answer it because, uh, yes, I don't have it in this uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, but uh, um, if you're not aligned, what is happening is as if you were working with a uh, north axis lens, right? So uh, you, instead of having your beam that come exactly in the optical axis is equivalent of displacing your optics in the, opti in the, uh, in the axis, which means that it's going to uh, essentially deflect light, right? Because this, the normal ray the one that passed by the optic centers is actually not at uh, uh, normal uh, normalcy. So you reduce uh, a little bit uh, the efficiency and you also start steering. But uh, we've made on purpose some off offset lenses and we characterize the response of those offset lenses. Uh, in order to see it, you, you, start, you need to be at least a few microns away, right? So uh, if you are only a few hundred of nanometers, which is typical, uh, resolution that you get when you do this kind of alignment using uh, um, um, uh, like inverted um, like a lithography system, uh, you 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 don't see it. Like uh, you basically don't see. It. But of course now, if you don't align it very well by ten to twenty micron off, as I mentioned, is equivalent as as, as uh, sending light in an off-axis lens and is going to be refracted at a certain angle. I mean, collimated if you want at a certain angle. Okay. Right, because this is uh, this is placed at the focal distance, so this is equivalent as keeping the light in the k space at the k equal to zero. So if, you, if, you, if you displace, is like uh, trying to impinge with a, a, a momentum, and so you start to refract at a certain angle. Super clear like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, Patrice. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are a bit late, so we have to move to the last part of a morning dedicated to an informal round table. And I leave the stage to my colleague, uh, Claudia. Thanks to all your all our speakers. So now the recording of the webinar will be stopped. And it's already there a pool to see who's interested in the round table. So please answer the pool and then the round table will be launched. I cannot vote, but he votes yes. He will voluntarily join. 